Laura, we have Tom Brady going back to the Super Bowl at age 43, trying to cap off what would be one of his most memorable postseason runs, having already beaten at this point in time Drew Brees and then Aaron Rodgers, and now taking aim at Patrick Mahomes at the age of 43. Tom Brady doing the unthinkable in his 10th, 10th Super Bowl. Think about that. And Patrick Mahomes now trying to win back-to-back -back Super Bowls to become the seventh quarterback to do it. The last one to do it, none other than Tom Brady, of course. So he gets to take on Tom Brady as Patrick Mahomes tries to win back-to-back -back Super Bowls. And the Kansas City Chiefs will have to make do without Eric Fisher, who has a torn Achilles, obviously out for this game. They're already missing their starting right tackle, Mitchell Schwartz, who's been out, with, out since week six with a back injury. So no Mitchell Schwartz. No Eric Fisher. That's a problem for Kansas City, but Andy Reid does believe they have some offensive tackle depth that they'll need to deploy on Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah, it's important, Adam. You'll be with us all show long. That storyline to watch, especially considering that they're going to face up against Shaq Barrett and Jason Pierre-Paul off the edge for the Bucks. So much more to come on this, but let's get to the NFC Championship game. We begin with one of the most talked about moments from Championship Sunday. Packers versus Bucks. We're picking it up in the fourth quarter. Packers with a third and goal trailing by eight. Aaron Rodgers looks like he's going to have some room here to run. He ends up trying to get the touchdown with his arm. He's frustrated after this because you felt like maybe he was going to have more opportunity. They end up deciding to go for the field goal here. You're going to hear from Rodgers in moments about this decision as well as LaFleur. And they make that, so that means Packers trail 31-26. to 26. But then the Bucks get the ball back, and this is third and four. Tom Brady to Tyler Johnson. Incomplete, but look at the flag there. Kevin King gets called for pass interference, giving Tampa Bay of first down and both Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers not thrilled with that call. You see Rodgers are making a case to the ref that Bucks drive would continue and later in the drive Godwin gets the handoff, picks up that first down that seals the victory. Here's LaFleur and Rodgers about the call to kick the field goal. We essentially had four timeouts with the two minute warning and you know we, we knew we needed to get a stop and I thought we were going to have a stop there at the end but you know, they, we got called for, for the P, PI, um, and it didn't work out. Well, I didn't have a decision on that one. Um, yeah, that wasn't my decision. I thought we, you know, maybe we we're going to have four chances to go. All right, so you heard what Aaron Rodgers said right there. Mina, let's just talk about this from the analytics perspective. What do the numbers say about that Ooh. situation and whether or not to go for it or kick the field goal? So ESPN's model slightly favored going for it. I think 99.9% uh, .9 of people at home, fave, that's not an exact calculation, <laughs> wanted the backers to go for it, at least based on my timeline. I think it was a little bit closer than it perhaps seemed, um, you know, because they were four, at fourth and eight. And with the field goal, if they got the stop, they could have then drove for the win. I understand LaFleur's thinking to some extent, especially given how much the Packers struggled in the red zone in this game in particular compared to the rest of the season. I mean, Rodgers was one for six targeting Adams, whereas he was 17 for 19 in goal-to-go -goal situations, or pardon me, in, in the red zone during the regular season. But all that said, we're talking about the best red zone offense in football. We're talking about a future Hall of Famer in Aaron Rodgers. 91% goal to go this year. I think you got to go for it. And then if you don't get it, you can <laughs> get the stop and try to tie the game. I, I, I don't think it was as objectionable perhaps as some people. But if it was me, Marcus, I would have relied on Rodgers and gone for it. Yeah, Marcus, people got really yeah. upset about this, as you might imagine. And as Mina pointed to, it really was like 99.9% .9 of people thought that they should have just gone <laughs> for it there. What did you make of this particular situation and the, the moments leading up to it, right? I actually, like, I, I didn't have a visceral reaction like everybody else. Like, understanding within the confines of football, I'm 100% with Mina, it's Aaron Rodgers. You give him an opportunity on fourth down. But also, Matt LaFleur told you what his thinking was. We didn't have a lot of success on the first three downs. Like, and, and, and that yeah. crept into his mind. So it may, it may have been a little fear. He may have had a little fear about not getting any points at all. So I, I, I understand it. Now, the football guy in me, 
the guy that relies on execution and the talent and all of these factors of why you should, if I got Aaron Rodgers, I'm going for it. And that's why everybody is so mad. Really, everybody is angry because Matt LaFleur has Aaron Rodgers as a quarterback, and he decided not to give him an opportunity to put the football in the end zone. Uh, you know what Matt LaFleur didn't have, Marcus? His starting left tackle, arguably mm. the best left tackle in the NFL in David Bakhtiari. And guys, that's why the Packers lost. It's not because they kicked a field goal there. I mean, the defensive decisions, we'll get into that in a moment. But on offense, they lost because their offensive line got whooped on the edges by Shaq Barrett and JPP. And I think perhaps we thought, oh, this offensive line, they played well against the Rams. They'll be fine. Billy Turner, Rick Wagner. Yeah. But Aaron Donald was hurt in that game, and I think it gave kind of a misleading picture as to the state of the Green Bay offensive line, which with Bakhtiari was the best in the NFL. Yeah, you know, Mina, you thought that, that this game would maybe expose the absence of Bakhtiari, and you could tell very early on that it did. That was just a, ch a chance where the Bucks were winning at the line of scrimmage throughout. Let's go to another really pivotal moment in this game, guys, and this one is the end of the first half, right? Second quarter, 34 seconds left in the half, second and 18 for Green Bay. Aaron Rodgers over the middle to Alan Lazard there, but intercepted by Sean Murphy Bunting, who's been playing really well. You'll see that one more time. And the Bucs, that means they're going to take over near midfield with seconds Six. remaining in this half. In fact, only eight seconds here for Tom Brady, right? But first and ten, Bucks and Packers territory. Tom Brady, deep shot to Scotty Miller. You've got to account for that, right? Mm. They don't. And Kevin King ends up getting beat in that moment. Let's hear from Matt LaFleur with more about this at the end of the half. Yeah, it was uh, man coverage. Definitely not the, the right call for the situation. Um, and you, you can't you can't do stuff like that against a good football team and expect to win. And I blame us uh, as coaches, you know, for for putting our guys in that situation. We, that's that's inexcusable. That should not have happened. All right, we're having some technical difficulties with Dan Orlovsky right now. I just want to put that out there. We're trying to get him back here. He called that the blind spot there, Marcus. What happened defensively? Uh, Mike Pitton point chain. That's what he's doing. <laughs> like, like, not in the literal sense. But when you look at this particular situation, get in the halftime, man. Why are you in single safety high coverage, man to man, against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers when you know Tom Brady is trying to gut yeah. you? And how important points are in that game. So I had a I had a major issue. And look, Matt LaFleur pointed to it. He said, we as coaches cannot put our players in that position. Yeah. The number one job, and y'all have heard me say it, the number one job of a coach is to put players in a position to be successful. We obviously saw that Green Bay did not do that on that play. And think about the swing. Like, Mina, think about what the swing did. Think about the demoralizing um, feeling that you have going into halftime down 20 to 10 as opposed to 13 to 10. I can tell you this as a football player, as a defensive guy, I'm walking into that locker room and I'm flipping some tables, kicking some holes in some whiteboards <laughs> that they about to tell us what we did wrong. You do not put your guys in that position at that critical stage, especially yeah. King. He was having a terrible night anyway. And let me say this, there is nothing deceptive about Scotty Miller's speed, okay? Nothing. He has got jets. Nothing. Um, I, I want everyone out there, all the fans who are angry at LaFleur, you got to direct like 90% of that anger towards the defensive coaching. Because to me, Marcus, that call was worse than the Greg Williams zero blitz that got everyone so riled yeah. up earlier in the gear because that game was meaningless. In fact, if anything, uh, it actually helped the Jets, whereas this was a playoff game, arguably uh, swung it, as you said. But I want to turn it to actually, while we're talking about coaching, something that happened right before the interception. So mm. we talked about how Matt LaFleur perhaps wasn't aggressive enough, and we're going to talk about how I think Sean McDermott wasn't aggressive enough, and we've seen a lot of that throughout the playoffs. You know who came to risk it for the biscuit? 
Bruce Arians calling the timeout <laughs> before the interception with 38 seconds left, trusting his offense to come back on the field and do something, then going for it on fourth down, throwing to Le Leonard Fournette. All of that happened, you know, before the play in question. That is the kind of aggression we need to see, especially going into a game against Patrick Mahomes that was missing in the AFC Championship. And I, for one, was heartened to see Bruce Arians take some risks. Only way to get the biscuit is to risk it. And as promised, Dan Orlovsky <laughs> with us now on NFL Live. Dan, hey! take, us, take us through that touchdown. I'm fixing to be aggressive on my dad on internet right now. So uh, many jokes. So that, that, so that, many jokes that, that touchdown really happens for three different reasons. You know, you guys talked about the aggressiveness of Bruce Arians, and that was a big deal in the fourth down conversion before of it. But first of all, it starts because Scotty Miller's cut split. Why does the cut split matter? It forces the corner Kevin King to play off. You can't get hands on Scotty Miller. That allows that speedster that Mean is talking about to get down the field. If you don't cut that split, Kevin King could put some hands on him, reroute him, then use that speed. The mm -hmm. second thing is, King is playing off and inside. It's bad leverage, but he's got vision on the quarterback right there. Scotty Miller is now in what's known as that blind spot. Look at all that space. Kevin King has got no idea where Scotty Miller is. He runs right by him. And the last is this. Tom Brady knows that.